We'd like to start with you just telling us a little bit about your background and how you um, arrived here at the, this point in your career in Atlanta. Okay, all right, that's, a, that's vast, and thank you for having me this morning. I stumbled into planning, actually. I was a student at Spelman College and matriculating through school, not sure of what I wanted to do, and switching majors constantly, and um, took a social science requirement and the, the, the course was called Urban Studies. And it really piqued my interest because I learned that there is an industry out there uh, that was involved in helping to shape places and helping people determine what their communities want it to be like. And I pursued it uh, as a career from there. I graduated from Spelman and went into Georgia Tech's planning program uh, right out of school with the under the direction of Dr. Catherine Ross, who introduced me to uh, Georgia Tech's planning and insisted that we needed a master's degree to do anything uh, with planning. And so I pursued that, and um, here I am today. It's taken, uh, uh, let's see, 29 years uh, to date <laughs> to get to where I am now. I actually worked for Georgia Tech out of uh, planning school uh, for six years. And let me go back to planning school, because I was very fortunate, and, and anyone who's gone through any planning school here in Atlanta is fortunate to have uh, the city of Atlanta as a laboratory for planning. So we get to take all of that theory and apply it in a lot of different ways and with a lot of agencies, have the uh, fortune to participate as an intern with MARTA during my matriculation through Georgia Tech with ARC. When ARC was downtown and they moved and now they're back downtown <laughs> uh, with, the, with the city of Atlanta and just a number of uh, private opportunities that helped um, influence what I learned about planning and how I engaged planning. So very fortunate to have had that opportunity to go to school here in Atlanta. Then it got good to me and I decided to stay <laughs> mm -hmm. after being uh, hired by Georgia Tech and one of my former professors who had a contract with the military to do planning around military bases and installations. And so as a very young woman, <laughs> I was traveling to uh, around the country and planning around uh, communities that were impacted by uh, the military operations. Mm -hmm. Moving from there, I worked for a small uh, management consulting firm before I started my own practice in 1993. And so I've been practicing consulting since 1993 and uh, ve again very fortunate to be uh, here in Atlanta and having uh, been provided a number of opportunities by a num with a number of governments and, and agencies. And um, here I am. I, don't, I can't see myself doing anything else. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about when you were in planning school because mm -hmm. we, as we were mentioning before the interview, <laughs> uh, planning um, was a male-dominated career like some of the more technical careers, I guess, in the, uh, the 50s, 60s. How many females were in your class uh, at that time, do you recall? Well, well amazingly, uh, out of about 35 students, there were a probably equal number of, of women um, in, the, in the class. And I think that was because Georgia Tech was intentional about recruiting um, females and minorities into the program at that time. And so we did experience a, 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 a higher number of students than normal. Now, when you get out into the, when we got out into the practice of it, that was a different story. It was very much male dominated. And not all of the females I went to school with pursued it, continued to pursue it as a career. But it, it was because Georgia Tech's program was intentional in, recru in recruitment at the time. So I, I was quite surprised at the number of students. Um, who were in the program, but then got out into the real world, and it was a, a slightly different. However, I didn't experience any um, uh, type of uh, discrimination or any uh, 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 any activity that would uh, suggest that, oh, you're a female in a male-dominated world. I was kind of welcomed into it, so um, I, I, I didn't experience that. All those stuffy men were ready to have somebody fun to, to, to serve with in their job. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and, and bring a, a different perspective. <laughs> right. Well, you've been involved um, as a consultant for many years. Can you tell us a little about some of the projects, the diversity of projects that you've been involved in? I have, I have, and, and again, very fortunate to have been involved in um, a number of projects 
actually one of the very first projects that, I, that my company was awarded was an Atlanta Regional Commission project mm. where it was a statewide aviation um, study update and we um, talked to aviation directors and airport directors around the state, primarily in the Atlanta region though, about what they wanted to do with their, um, their airports. And I, I had kind of taken on a focus of transportation during graduate school and thought I'd end up in that field. I certainly started out in, in, that, in pursuing that and in that, in that field. Um, as, a, as a graduate student, I worked on the fourth um, the environmental assessment for the fourth runway at Hartsfield Airport. And that really gave me um, uh, and some insight in terms of where the city of Atlanta was going and, and, and how they wanted to get there and what they wanted to do. But then, um, as opportunities began to present themselves, I thought back on, on graduate school and how our our curriculum was very vast and we had to know everything. It's a very different program today than it was when we were in school. We were required to uh, be proficient in everything. <laughs> so I started taking on other land use and, and uh, uh, housing type projects, master planning projects around the, the community. I, I have really enjoyed working in smaller communities um, in the city of Atlanta and helping people to understand how they um, how they get a chance to influence the process, and as a result of that, have taken on a significant practice in what we call public involvement, <laughs> um, really engaging the community in, in uh, help, helping us to understand what is important to them. Now, they didn't teach that in graduate school, and I, I, I don't think they, they do now. So I, I learned public involvement the hard way. But my, uh, pr my career, my consulting career, has taken me around the state, but certainly focused here in the Atlanta area with a number of governments as my clients. You know, uh, I, I bring this up to you every time I see you, that how well you did. Um, right after Hurricane Katrina, you and I <laughs> um, were responsible for a big event here where we had more than 150 Katrina evacuees right. here in Atlanta. And, and you handled that <laughs> very difficult public meeting so well, and I was so impressed with you. So I um, wanted to make sure I said that. Oh, thank you. I. I uh, that's what I like. I like the big controversial uh, meetings. I do better in those. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must be in high demand. <laughs> um, you know, on that topic, uh, you know, we seem to in Metro Atlanta, <clears throat> you know, we, even more recently, a lot of discussion of exclusionary practices and NIMBYs and, and, and trying to figure out um, a balance between communities deciding their future, yet yet everyone not being their own enclave of, mm -hmm. of, of their type of, of persons. Can right. you talk a little bit about that? In your yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned and, and sometimes, get, sometimes get worried about, um, about that. And we were talking before we got started this morning with Lance about um, uh, educating people and using technology to educate people. If you, go out on the, if you go outside right now, out on the street, and you ask the average person, what planning is, uh, they would have no idea. I can tell you now that some of my family members don't know what I do. They don't, <laughs> they don't really grasp it just yet. And, and I've been doing it all my career, but, but they don't, they don't uh, understand that. And, and, so, and, and so as my family goes, so does the public go. And, and, and most people will not understand or be able to tell you what planning is. And we, so then with that, we go out and, and tell the public that we've got this project that we're going to work on in their community and um, it's a planning project and we want their input but we haven't given them the tools to help us to help them create their um, what we want from them. So I, I, I think we've missed that in, in planning that we've not done the best job in terms and, and that we can do a better job in terms of educating the community on what planning is and um, how their input can make a difference, where it could make a difference, uh, what level of input they might have. And um, it, we always have to understand that planning is for people. And I learned that the hard way. I, I have some stories. I, I was working, I told you, on the military project, uh, traveling around the country and up in Antwerp, New York at Fort Drum. And we had done this grand master plan for Fort Drum and all of their communities around um, that installation. 
So, of course, we had a public hearing. <laughs> so we went to the auditorium that evening, and, and um, we, there were probably about 20 people there, a very small town. And we presented our, our plan to the public, and, and they were very patient as we conducted our presentation, and we opened it up for questions and answers afterwards. And um, a woman was very methodical. She said, okay. She said, this sounds really good. Now, uh, who did you talk to about this plan? And I said, well, you know, we talked to the planning director and the zoning director and the chamber of commerce and a number of leaders in the community about the plan. And they said, okay, and they gave you input. Now, who did you talk to in the community? Because you called out some neighborhoods and you called out some communities that you uh, thought needed to have some um, implementation, some recommendations and projects implemented. Who did you talk to that was a resident? Or anything? I said, well, we didn't talk to anybody. I mean, and my, and our, our um, response was, why did we? Why should we? And they said, okay, well, you can't come into our community and conduct a plan for a community whose people you haven't talked to and, and whose people you haven't talked to. And, and you, you saw the community, but you didn't talk to all of the community. You talked to some perspectives, but you didn't talk to the people who are going to be living with your recommendations every day. So that really helped shape how I approached um, public involvement and then kind of uh, looked at uh, and look at it from that perspective all the time. And, and, and also, I'm, when I'm not planning, I'm active in my community here um, in the South Fulton area. So I, I manage a, a nonprofit volunteer business association, and I bring the planning perspective to the to the um, group. So I get a chance to sit on both sides of the <laughs> of a spectrum, and and but it also informs me in terms of what people are um, interested in and and what their issues are, and and what level they come in to a process with, and and how we can help better shape them shape their ideas and, and help them focus better on their communities. Do you think the uh, Atlanta area is unique in some of our ways of, uh, of, of the, the public dealing with planning or our sophistication or some of our issues or do you think we're sort of a, just a subset of, of the way the America, America seems to be going? Well, I, I, I think a little bit of both. I think we're unique in terms of uh, just getting out there and, and giving people a chance. When I started in, in this real, really uh, gung-ho into the public involvement thing, it became very obvious and, and important that we need to um, include all levels of our population, all segments of the population. And I experienced a number of, uh, of planners and governments who were not seeking um, every segment of the population out for input. And, and sometimes it was, um, it was intentional. So I think in, in terms of how Atlanta has looked at it, Atlanta has been very intentional in seeking out uh, every segment of the population. Um, uh, people of all races, uh, the physically challenged, young people, and, and now moving toward um, kind of high tech ways, and I think we're going to have to do that more. But there's there's never going to be there's never going to be a substitute for face to face conversation with people. We're not going to be able to turn it over to technology. One thing I am concerned about, though, in the Atlanta area, and it's it's probably happening everywhere, is that um, now we've come full circle. So we have so much going on in the Atlanta area that we're all on top of people with our public and public involvement. <laughs> so I've got a project, you've got a project, everybody's got a project, but the public is the same. And, and so every other day they all get an invitation for a meeting. Um, and, and so meetings ha have, uh, I think, um, have their place, but we've got to look at other ways of engaging the public and, and, and how we can go to them. And again, how we can make sure that all segments of the population are engaged uh, through our tools that we use and, and, and through education. I am a little concerned about public involvement in Atlanta right now. Hmm. Um, and and uh, some in, in governments... Just the city of Atlanta or... In the, oh, in the, in the region, uh, okay. in the whole state, in, 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 in the whole state. And the reason being is that we limit ourselves to 
relying on the public to come to meetings and, and that we use participation in meetings as a gauge in terms of whether our public involvement processes have been successful or not. And we, we used to, and that was okay um, 20 years ago when people were not so busy and having two-hour commutes and, <laughs> and, and children all over the place in school and, and other obligations. That was okay at that time. But we've, we're in a different time, and we have to make sure that we provide other methods for people to participate um, in our process other than expecting for them to attend a meeting on a Tuesday or Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So the tools that certainly that ARC it's using or using the um, uh, and other agencies in terms of, of uh, getting out to people are going to be crucial in terms of, of public involvement. We uh, one thing that we're not going to be able to do is is to stop doing it. And I think there are a lot of people who would like to just say, you know what, we're we're not going to do public involvement anymore. But we can't because again, public involvement is is um, is for I mean, planning is for people. It has gotten tougher um, as it seems like civic engagement, there's lots of theories out there that people are dis, more disconnected from government and from their communities in many ways. Um, you think that's true of Atlanta also? It is true. Um, it's true of Atlanta. It's true of the region. And you know why, Dan? We haven't <clears throat> been on top of implementation like we should have. So over the years, we've engaged people in lots and lots of projects and by and large promised them that we were going to deliver and we always haven't. We haven't always delivered. And so having been around for almost 30 years and circling back to some of the same people I was out there with 15 or 20 years ago and um, with their projects and, and they'll say, Inga, you were here 10 or 15 years ago and you you know, you engaged us, you had us come out to all these meetings, and this road was going to be built, or, or this system was going to be built, and nothing's happened. So I think they're losing a little faith in us, and, and we've got to turn that around, not, not, uh, not to mention the fact that we need a lot of the projects that, not, that haven't come out of the ground yet. We've got to instill a, um, a trust in the, in the community that we're going to be able to deliver. Yeah, it seems in terms of at least infrastructure, we've gone through these interesting periods. You can almost break it into different periods. You can, you can. And now you wonder if we're at a, a transitional period to where a lot of what we've promised is being determined. Um, maybe we haven't delivered. Right. Now we're focusing, how do we deliver? And how do we deliver and what we deliver. Now, one thing that the city, now the, the city knows, the, the people know that um, that you can deliver. They saw it during the process of the Olympics. That, that process and that planning process during that time changed the face of the city. And uh, projects came out of the ground in, <laughs> in record time. So they, they know that things can happen. Uh, but we've got to just get back and, and make sure that we deliver on those infrastructure projects that, that are actually going to affect the quality of their lives in the, in the very near future. Can you talk a little bit about that time period leading up to the Olympics and then afterwards? It's, it seems like that a lot of speakers have mentioned that as being this sort of point where the rebirth of Atlanta really took off. Yeah, and, and I've and having been around for as long as I have, I've actually seen the city transform several times. The city really transformed. Let me let me go back before sure. the, the Olympics. The, the city really transformed in the 70s leading into the 80s when uh, the the airport the new airport was um, was built at the same time Marta was building the uh, train system and it, and and the interstate system was really being expanded so in the 70s early 80s there was a major transformation of of development of infrastructure if you will in the the city of Atlanta and I came here in 1975 um, interstate 85 was four lanes and uh, over by the stadium there were shotgun houses that were still there. People lived right up on the interstate and um, after a while, you, you, you know, there, it was just a matter of time that, uh, that, the, that before the interstate was four la uh, eight lanes and, and now what, six or, I mean, 12 lanes or so. And, and, and it, was, it was construction 
mayhem at the at the time in the late seventies, early. Everybody was was building. The airport was building. Marta was building. The interstate was building, and and it was a really interesting time. So you could really see planning, uh, the intentional the intention of planning evolving, and then with the announcement, and and that continued through the eighties, with the announcement of um, the Olympics. Uh, came a, 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 another transformation. Not only did the, the transformation in terms of the physical development of the region change and, and certainly uh, the city of Atlanta, but the population increased significantly. People came here for uh, jobs and opportunities and they never left. And, and, and at the time I, I was kind of um, wondering what, what's happening? And all you have to do when you want to know what's happening in a community, all you have to do is go and, and talk to a school system. <laughs> and they'll tell you everything about about population increase and population change and who's moving in, into the communities and why. And I remember talking to some schools, um, and, and they were about to be overwhelmed with uh, an increase of students whose parents are moving into the city of Atlanta to take advantage of, and from all over, to take advantage of the opportunities that the Olympics would bring. Then came the planning for the Olympics. So, you know, it... The, the planning not only for venues and, and, and the developments that were going to um, house the Olympic uh, uh, act activities, but also planning that, uh, that would impact those neighborhoods that were going to experience some level of change as it related to uh, the Olympics. So the city set about to do a, a series of master plans for um, a number of communities that were around these large venues. So planning was occurring for the physical venues and planning was occurring for uh, some in-town neighborhoods that were also uh, going to be affected. And that was a real exciting time. And um, that really gauged or gave uh, a lot of hope to people in the Atlanta area that, hey, we can, we can do some things. So we came out of the 70s and the 80s with our infrastructure and now we have some venues that a lot of institutions really benefited from and so that's you know that's on their minds and so I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not surprised that a number of people have mentioned the Olympics because they because it, it was made to happen you know it, it amazes me when I ride around the city of Atlanta to see the transformation even recently this decade of neighborhoods yes, yes absolutely um, and it, it's uh, having grown up in Athens outside of the Atlanta region um, still having some of those outside of the region perceptions of what in the city of Atlanta neighborhoods may be and now seeing city of Atlanta neighborhoods that probably are much different than a lot of residents of the state have a vision of them. Right, absolutely. And 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 that that's changed. I think that's that's a, a symptom of of cities around the country. And so there's the third transformation of what's happening and what's occurring in the city right now in terms of of transforming neighborhoods. So in the 80s and the 90s, these neighborhoods, these same neighborhoods, had declined significantly. People had moved out, the middle class had moved out to the dream of the suburbs for uh, different reasons and left um, um, the neighborhoods to kind of decline and deteriorate. I tell you what, I wish I had invested in some of those neighborhoods we always talked about. I wish we had invested in some of those neighborhoods that we saw declining because those same neighborhoods, right. those same houses that... Uh, um, you know, we used to talk about needing repair and and just needing planning, and that and, and again, it goes back to the intention of the of what was happening during the Olympics of helping those communities um, uh, revitalize. What we're seeing now in terms of, of of those same communities is amazing. So those same suburbanites are moving back into the city and and helping uh, kind of repurpose and revitalize and redevelop. Uh, these communities and it, and it's making for a really really big change um, in the city and along with some of the programs that help um, put that community infrastructure together the LCI program the TE uh, streetscape program through Georgia DOT uh, a number of the uh, TMAs the transportation management associations who are really now focusing on not necessarily regional uh, planning but real community planning. And that's where we, we see um, the involvement of the public and the impact of the public being felt the most. And that they can put their arms around too. And, and, and so it's real exciting what's, what's occurring. Do you think neighborhood planning is a little bit of an evolution of planning in our state? We seem to have gone from uh, 
you know, having some communities have plans in the 70s and into the 80s. We got the Georgia Planning Act right. in the late 80s. Right. We did countywide or citywide comprehensive plans. Now it seems like we're going the next step to really get into the details of community planning. Right, and, and I think that's the only way that you're going to be able to, it's kind of like taking small steps before you get to the, it, it's hard to implement a regional plan all at one time. It's hard to implement a county plan all at one time. You've got to, you've got to take pieces of it. But you know, Dan, I think those communities that are uh, intentional about planning, planning has to be intentional. Those, those communities that are intentional about planning, those communities that are seeking out uh, the opportunities that exist out there for the LCI type uh, um, activities are the ones that are going to realize the successes um, uh, related to what they want their communities to look like. I also in my in my uh, experience see a lot of communities that I think for lack of a better word are afraid. They're afraid of planning and uh, I, I just worked on a master plan for my hometown in South Carolina last year. Very small town just north of Columbia and I was real excited to have been chosen, be on a team of, of consultants chosen to conduct that plan and uh, started to work there a little bit and realized that um, the town that I left, not only had it declined and just declined over a couple of decades, but the people were afraid. They're afraid to, um, to take on the challenge of, of uh, planning and kind of repurposing and redeveloping their community. So it's almost as if they'd rather let it continue to decline. And, I, and as I left and, and, and told them that uh, what their responsibility is and, and will be for the future in terms of that plan, you know, in our consulting world, we say uh, the no-build option, doing nothing is not an option. Um, uh, you've got to do something. If you don't do anything, then your community is, is going to decline and, and you'll lose control of what um, happens as it relates to planning. So, yes, I think the, the as, as the Georgia, I'm, I'm, and I'm back to the Georgia Planning Act. I'm glad that that was implemented because it's forcing, for lack of a better word, <laughs> it forces communities to plan. Whether they take those plans and put them on a shelf or whether they take it to the next level, it, it still forces them to look at what's happening in their communities. And um, it was one of the best things to happen uh, for the state of Georgia. And, 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 and it allowed the state, too, to look a lot closer at um, the counties and communities that, that are um, uh, within its boundaries. But back to your original question, sure. I think I went all around. Sure. I, I do think the neighborhood level planning, the community level planning is, is um, kind of the wave of the future because it's what people can touch and feel. I, we do all of these big regional plans and we're asking people to um, um, comment on something that is a process or a project that's 30 miles away from them. Some of them never get out of their own community, so they can't even begin to um, comment on what's happening 30 or 40 miles from them. That's how big our region is. But when we bring it down to their level, I, I think that's when, um, that's when it has the most impact. And um, they appreciate that opportunity the most. You mentioned uh, we haven't talked much about schools um, yeah. and the impact of schools and in terms of <clears throat> a draw to people leaving the city mm -hmm, to good schools mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. schools as they are focus of communities and, right. and, and, and again back to that civic engagement a lot of people are more engaged in their kids schools right. than anything else. Right. Can you t talk a little bit about th that interaction of schools and planning? And yeah, I, I think it's vitally important um, because our, I have a motto. <laughs> and my motto is that our communities are only as good as our schools are. If we don't have good schools, then our communities are, are going to be marginal at best. And it's very important for everyone, whether you have children or not, to get involved in uh, the schools in your backyard, in your community because it helps uh, form kind of where you're going and, and what happens. Uh, it, it, it certainly helps inform how your community is changing. And I, I mentioned a, a few minutes ago about how if you want to know something about your community, all you have to do is, is find it, uh, talk about, or look at your school. But I think planning, and, and although we're not directly responsible for the school system, I think we do have to help shape how our schools are formed how our schools are built, where they're built, um, what uh, kind of what they look like, and help the, the parents understand 
all of that so that they can um, then help shape our, our, our communities. The, the uh, public school systems are certainly a draw. It, they, it's either a draw or it's either a, a reason to run away from a community. And, and that has major impact. And we saw that in the, in the 80s. People left um, the city out to go out to the suburbs for the draw of schools. And, and, um, but, it, and you say parents are involved <laughs> <laughs> in their schools. Um, a lot of them are. There, there could be better involvement. But I, I do think our business community um, has to step up to the plate in terms of, of helping our schools and going in and, and, and showing what, uh, uh, what planning is all about, and then just working with the school system to help make sound decisions about where schools are located and and what they're <laughs> how they're going to impact a community. That that interest uh, that issue of parents involved is interesting. I mean, do, to what degree? You know, we all have. It seems like I wonder now if it's 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 tougher to live now than it was in my parents' generation, or or maybe it's all relative, but. Do you think the way we plan our communities and the need to drive a car and be, you know, live maybe far from your you job, yeah. your kids, your how much time, are all these connected in some I, way? It's all connected. It's 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 all connected, and and unfortunately, we have um, uh, we are a different um, we are we're living in a different time, or we we have different uh, opportunities and avenues. So you have you have you've had the opportunity uh, when I grew up, my elementary school was in my backyard so we you know we just walked to school and um, and my mother worked at the school so she walked to school too <laughs> um, but jobs now have have sprawled us out so the sprawl has has brought uh, a sprawl of jobs and people are always looking for better opportunities make more money but it takes them further farther and farther away from their families and it and and um, and, it, and when, it, when that happens, it causes a disconnect between the families and certainly between uh, the schools. So if your child gets into trouble and, and, uh, at school or something happens, they get sick or something at school, and you're, you're an hour away, it, 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 it presents a challenge. And you're an hour away in, in uh, non-peak traffic time. It, it, it presents a real challenge for you to stay on top of um, of what's happening at that school and certainly stay on top of what is happening in your child's future. So now, now you see people making intentional decisions about um, whether they're going to stay at home or whether they're going to take a part-time job or try and work at home so that they can be closer to their kids and, and closer to the impact of, of, um, of the schools and certainly uh, having an opportunity to get into those schools. It's important that we get into the schools and see what's happening. Um, and, and, and parents are responsible for that. So I think decisions have to be made that, um, that are intentional in, in terms of that regard. You know, over the, the, the past you know, 40, 50 years, um, you know, government and planning, maybe we were, we were less involved. Some of that was um, just uh, because we, we weren't maybe prepared or, or ready. Um, right. Local governments weren't, didn't have staff. But now there's almost a, there's there's some intermix of trends of government regulations need to be minimized. The market should be more um, uh, active in deciding communities. Can you talk a little bit about how much control, or you know, because obviously having no rules is, is maybe not the best option either. Right. Having no rules, having no rules is definitely not an option, and and I, I don't see that that, that a lot of the regu regulations are um, are that stringent. Uh, having no rules and and looking at some of the regulations that have been born out of what we've learned from planning over the past forty or fifty years, I think are necessary for our communities. We um, we look at, uh, for instance, the environmental justice. Um, regulations that were born out of the civil rights era, where uh, prior to that, uh, large infrastructure development was um, going into uh, low income and minority communities for several reasons. They, you know, a lot of them didn't own their, their properties. Um, they are the last to be civically engaged. And, and so in a sense, they, I saw a white paper that was out of California about 20 years ago that um, said, hey, here, if you want to, um, here's where you should go 
to develop your infrastructure. And it, it targeted low-income and minority communities. And so regulations like the environmental justice regulations are very important. I think uh, zoning is vital. It is, it is uh, very important to uh, the sound uh, development of communities. And in the community where I, I uh, uh, <laughs> and where I volunteer, I'm always advocating for more <laughs> regulations mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of less. Because if, if we don't have it, then um, uh, then undesirable uh, trends of planning will start to occur because they're market driven. So they'll look at a community and say, you know what, we're going to put the pawn shops and the liquor stores and the um, and, and title maxes and all those things in the in this community because they're least resistant and because they also don't have any regulations, <laughs> this is where we can go. So I, I think the regulations are necessary. Uh, sometimes um, they have unintended consequences and we have to revisit them, but that's one thing about all regulations is that they can be revisited uh, for their performance, but I think they are very necessary. <laughs> well, I often say if I was going to be a developer, I'd go to one of those Wild West communities that's that, right. that don't have a lot of regulation. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, and then some developers come yeah. in and they're surprised that certain communities have regulations. And they're like, well, why do you have these regulations? Well, well you, you mentioned the, the, <clears throat> the way infrastructure investments have been, been made, and we've got some interesting stories in the history of of Atlanta from the Presidential Parkway to right. uh, um, uh, the, the, the issues around Lindbergh when uh, MARTA and, and uh, they're trying to figure out how to develop the area around the Lindbergh, right. uh, it's the Lindbergh MARTA station, or no, uh, where, the, where the headquarters of MARTA are located, it's Lindbergh. Right. Um, you, do you think we have learned something from those major and you know where the public sector and, and and neighborhoods were really battling, and we had these. Do you think we've learned, or are we still sort of, uh, uh, or, or is environmental justice still a, a, a an issue we need to focus on? It it very much is a an issue that we need to focus on. However, we need to make sure that it's tempered and that it's um, handled and managed in the right way. On the other side of regulation, sometimes I see people taking advantage of that kind of regulation. I'm working on a project in North Carolina where I, I think some um, people in the community are taking advantage of uh, environmental justice as a way to keep a project out of their community. It's probably not uh, fully justified. Um, we have learned to a degree, but we have to, um, again, get back to the point where there's a balance and, and, and where planners are working in sync with neighborhoods. and. I have to be honest with you, we don't always want to do that. And, and, and especially with the um, technology that has come to planning uh, now, you can sit down at your computer and do a plan for a community that you've never seen before and whose people you never talked to because you have all of the tools at your uh, fingertips to do a plan. And it could be a nice plan and, and Dan may think, hey, this is what that community needs and, and they'll be okay. You know, we'll um, give them a few concessions and they'll be okay. But we can't um, always do that. So we, we have to strike a real um, strong balance, a decent balance in terms of, of uh, planning and neighborhoods. Now, there are times when, um, for the public good, the um, uh, decisions have to be made and, uh, and you have to put your fist down. But for the most part, once you get in and begin to talk to people and talk about... Um, uh, the importance of projects and how they can help shape them. Well, where do you think the road should go instead of this way? And um, we usually come up with a, a, a happy medium. You, you talked about technology. Uh, can you talk a little <laughs> bit about the early technology uh, when we used to use pencils and, and a lot of people won't know what a planimeter is. But. That's right. <laughs> or hand drawing maps. There was a, you know, this whole uh, GIS is a very uh, recent occurrence and, and so there was no such thing as that. Uh, and, and I can remember being at Tech and having our um, stormwater management professor have the Texas Instrument uh, computers or calculators chained to his desk for us to come in and use and calculate stormwater. Um, it, it's come a long way, and we have to keep up. And, and, and it, it's changing faster now than, and, than it ever has changed, and, and we as planners have to make sure that we're keeping up with not only 
the technology that's related yeah. to planning, but again, back to the technology of how we communicate with people. Um, and and I was the there was a recent it was the awards um, volume of the APA monthly magazine, and, and and it highlighted several awards around the country to uh, planning uh, processes. But one of the articles talked about um, using technology. In, in terms of communicating with people and, and, and particularly communicating with young people, conducting focus groups, conducting meetings, conducting input, um, using GIS and, and kind of 3D visualization to uh, help people understand kind of their place and what things will look like on the ground. It was a very interesting article, uh, but it really spoke volumes to how technology is going to play or is playing a major role in planning. And we as planners have to keep up with that so that um, we can maximize, you know, those those opportunities where it relates to civic engagement and, and, and how we do things as well. Again, we have to always be open to change. And uh, change is going to occur around us whether we like it or not. And uh, But we have to, if we're going to continue growing and, and, and making meaningful, meaningful decisions, we're going to have to make sure that we keep up. <laughs> With change. You know, um, and over the, you know, I look over the past 40, 50 years and think a lot of the mistakes we made, we didn't maybe again have the right tools. Right. Um, we didn't have GIS. Maybe these, some of the environmental uh, problems or, or runoff or, or the way we made transportation right. investments. We didn't, right. maybe we didn't, but now looking back and looking at the experiences of other places in America, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes make an argument that we have no excuses anymore. We sort of know what works. We have all the tools. Mm -hmm. We, we mm -hmm. know different ordinances right. and things that can occur. There's good examples of development around the country, if, if not in Georgia and Atlanta. Right. Would you agree with that? Or? I, d I do agree with that. There is no excuse at this point for, for us to make any missteps. Um, everything is at our, at, at our fingertips, and we have to use those opportunities to um, change our mindset in terms of how we um, go about make, uh, conducting our, the, plan, the planning process. We're just not going to be able to be in our own little fiefdoms and think that we can uh, plan for uh, people and not engage them, not use, uh, maximize the opportunities to use the tools that are in place for us. Um, and, and it boils down to being accountable. We have to be accountable. And the and it's and the public is going to hold us responsible for being accountable, <laughs> and and we have to change our mindset too in terms of wanting to be accountable uh, to the public. That it's not just about our grand designs and how pretty they are and and um, how much money they'll save or what they're going to look like and and getting an award for it. You know, we really have to be uh, uh, conscientious about uh, what that plan means and who it's going to. Um, impact. So you're right. There are no more excuses. <laughs> they they need to hold our feet to the fire. So a lot of our issues now in our current state, uh, current time period, are issues of politics, of maybe not having enough funding. Uh, they're not so much legal barriers or barriers of science or or things. It seems like is that sort of true. That is absolutely <laughs> without a doubt true, Dan. Well, Politics uh, have a major impact on uh, whether projects are implemented um, or not. And I have to be honest with you, and I, I'm going to be honest when I say this, I'm really concerned about the metropolitan uh, Atlanta region because we have allowed politics to influence um, decisions that are made about our infrastructure and, and how we do things. And we have new chiefs around, so we have new governments around, and so that's layer, additional layers of bureaucracy that um, I, I think, I hope not, but I'm afraid might uh, continue to impact decisions that need to be made on a, on a regional basis. Uh, not, notwithstanding, too, the fact that, you know, elected officials are lay people. And this whole planning thing is not something that uh, they're familiar with necessarily. People are elected sometimes for a, a cause that they well, championed in their community or at some point. And, and so just like we have to educate the community, they're part of the community too. 
and they need to be educated as well about um, how planning is conducting, conducted and how their decisions affect what's done or what's not done. And so, no, that's a very real I, I, I assume you would agree that transit is one of those transit infrastructure <laughs> and our dominance of automobiles and automobile infrastructure in this region, um, at least um, in, in outside of the MARTA service area, right. um, is one of those political issues. Um, how, any thoughts about how we bridge um, across counties um, to really see how we uh, address our transportation issues? Yeah, and, and, and you know what, uh, Dan, I think we're going to be forced to do that. We're going to be forced, we're going to be forced to uh, uh, deal with uh, the need for transit outside of our region and unfortunately transit, believe it or not, is still looked down upon by a lot of people in this region. When you go out and talk to people about riding the bus or riding the train or just using public transportation, there are still a lot of negative or, or actually kind of um, misinformed perceptions about transit out there. So here goes with the education again. We've got to um, educate our decision makers along with our public about the need for um, transportation and, and transit investment in the community that should have occurred a long, long time ago. And, and, and so many of the same people, it's interesting because so many of the same people who are um, who have the negative perceptions about transit in the, the Atlanta region travel abroad to Europe and all of these countries where the transit infrastructure grew up with the city. And they come back and talk about how they traveled around Europe on the train and that's the way to go. But they can't see it in their own backyards. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense to them. Or it doesn't, it's a, it's a, a negative perception. And they, they're hearing it from their communities. I was in a meeting in my own community the other day. We were trying to extend uh, some bus service in an area that doesn't uh, uh, currently receive the bus service and in a, a community meeting. And believe it or not, people are still saying, if they bring this bus down here, it's going to cause crime in our communities. And not only don't we want them, we not only don't we want the bus in our community, we don't want people walking in our community. <laughs> and so they're, they're still, though, this is you know, during the month of April 2008. And, and so there's still those, those um, negative perceptions of what public transit is about. But we'll, um, if we don't do something soon, we'll um, choke on it. So we, we've, got to, we've got to do something If soon. you're walking in Metro Atlanta, you might be confused <laughs> as being homeless, right? You might be confused <laughs> as being homeless and, and, uh, and hurting somebody if you get on the bus or the, or the train. When you say we're going to be required to address transit. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that from traffic congestion or the price of gasoline or? or All of the above, both of those. Uh, and, and we never, I never equated the uh, price of gasoline or never put the equation of gasoline in transit, uh, the need for transit five years ago. We didn't, we didn't know we'd be where we are now. But uh, certainly that's going to have an impact, but just uh, from a, a traffic congestion but a, 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 a scenario. But also, more importantly, is that we need to make sure that we give people op options. And so our uh, population is aging. Uh, people are getting older. Again, I have a story about that same, the same community that I volunteer in. So there was a developer who wanted to uh, put in a, a senior citizen facility in in, in an area that's totally isolated from anything, isolated from public transit, isolated from um, services and, and even access to services, no sidewalks. And, and, and so we have to be intentional about, um, about uh, transit and making sure that we look beyond, um, well, that we, <laughs> our, our transit, pro the, the problem with our transit projects are, are that they're long-term. and we can't wait 20 years. We can't wait 35 years to, um, to start uh, uh, turning dirt. We've got to, to do something right now. Or else, not only is the traffic congestion going to get bad, but we're going to totally isolate people and, and confine them um, to their homes where they have no other means of, of, of getting around uh, the Atlanta area, where they can't even go to the store. If, unless they have family to, uh, to take them. And so I think that's equally important when we, when we, when we start to look at transit, the needs of transit. Do you, do you think the issues of uh, 
investments right now are one of just the pot of money is not big enough, our priorities maybe aren't balanced, is it both? Um, is I think people are just afraid to make decisions, you know, I, I, I really do. I, I think people are just, sure, there's the money issue, but that won't, we've gone through that before. We've gone through the money issue before in the region and in the country, so that'll, that'll uh, take care of itself. The um, priority of projects, you know, we could, uh, we could do any number of things, but I, I, really, I really and truly think that, that our leaders are afraid to uh, make some real solid decisions. I, I think that's it. Hmm. The, the, the information is out there for them, and you can start where you'd like to start, but, you know, you need to start somewhere. <laughs> but I think people are afraid to make decisions. Well, you've been involved in a, a lot of public involvement. What do you think are some, some of the, the best experiences you've had, um, some of the, the best planning with, that we've done in this region? Any, any thought, anything come to mind in terms of, in your career, either processes or the plans, or which ones had the most impact? Or I, I could say certainly early on when MARTA was developing the train system, um, they did an excellent job reaching out to um, people about that train system and where it was going to go and how it was going to impact them. Um, they got on the buses and rode with, <laughs> with, the, with the riders and, and talked about the, the process, and it, I think it helped shape how the uh, system was developed. I also think that um, just, the, just engaging people at their community level now um, is, is, um, is very important. And people are, are very visual, and wherever you can um, get them on a, on a um, take them out into the community while we're planning is good. So we worked on a project where we were extending, um, looking at extending some MARTA service out I-20, and uh, we had, and, and uh, both directions in, in, um, on I-20. And we were going to, because the corridor was so long, we were going to involve communities, once again, bringing communities and people together who had never, who never, who don't even know each other, and, and certainly they'd never been in each other's communities. Well, the first thing that we set out to do was to uh, get them on a bus and take them on a tour of uh, the study area so that they could uh, do two things, so that they could meet the people that re they were going to be working with over the next several months to help shape what this um, extension would look like, but also so they could see, see and visually see the communities that were going to be affected uh, by the process. And I think that's one of the best things that we can do when we're starting planning processes is to get the people out into the community so that they can visualize and see what else is out there beyond their backyard. And we did that also with, um, with the community that I volunteer in. I wanted them to see other communities that were being shaped because it's one thing for us to come in and start talking our planning uh, jargon and, and bring in pretty pictures and show people what their communities could look like. But what people want to see is, well, where else has it been done or where else is it being done? And so taking them on a tour of a, a community that's already uh, doing it and looking at how um, it could happen in your community, I think is very, very important. So wherever we can, um, where projects that I've worked on there where we've taken people on tours and, and, and let them see a, a corridor or a community from a different uh, uh, set of eyes is, is very important. I want to ask you a question. It's a little bit for fun, but I think there's some truth in this. Is that you're one of the few women we're interviewing. Right now, the head of MARTA is a, a female. Mm -hmm, the head of Georgia mm -hmm. DOT is, mm -hmm. a, is a female professional. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think women have a little... Uh, has, uh, are we had a period of time where women are just emerging into these leadership positions. Um, or do you think we've reached a point where we really need women, a female insight into some of these issues? Or, because you seem to not, you seem to have more of a, um, a different sort of perspective on public involvement in some of these things than a lot of men would. Oh, okay. So it's, it's sort of interesting. I took that over from a lot of men. I saw a lot of men <laughs> kind of mess up the public involvement activities early on. I said, you know what? You're a more Step sensitive. aside. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this. You're I'm going to take care of it. You're a little more sensitive, but little, we've, we've, yeah. we've got more women in leadership positions. Yeah, yeah, a little more sensitive and, and, and bringing different 
I think women bring different perspectives to uh, the table. And so men have realized that they're, and people in general have realized that it's important to look at different perspectives and uh, allow different perspectives to enter into a process so that, um, so that we're not the only ones kind of making decisions. We need to listen to somebody else sometime about what they're, uh, what they're, uh, what they're thinking and, and how they see things. But I, I, I think um, it's an emergence of just women in uh, the work world in general. So we're seeing not only an increase of women leadership in planning, but women leadership in, in, the, in corporate America, uh, women leadership in institutions. So I, I think that's a, a, a not necessarily um, <laughs> to, uh, totally a planning thing. It's a, yeah, it's it's what we're seeing in in the in the work world. In general. But in planning, it seems to be a positive trend. I, I think it's, it's a it's, very positive trend, and and I'm I'm glad to see it. My mentor was a male. I, I was mentored by a male. I was there were no female mentors um, by and large when I got out of school. Uh, in terms of working under them. My mentors, I have to admit, have been all males. And, and so uh, I, I think it's a real good thing that, uh, number one, that the men saw that, 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 that uh, it was okay to mentor <laughs> some women. And I bet if you, if you go back and talk to a number of women, they'll tell you that their mentors were men um, because there were uh, very few women at the time who were um, out there. And so uh, with that said, I think we've come a long way in planning, and especially um, looking at uh, the how we work together in terms of of uh, processes, and 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 it hasn't been easy. Uh, there, you know, there've been early on in my career, I, ex I didn't, I've never experienced discrimination as such, but I dis I experienced some. <laughs> kind of hands off by men that are like, wait a minute, you <laughs> you know, what are you doing here? And, and, uh, and who are you? And, um, and, and so, uh, but you, you have to persevere and, and, and bring to the table what you bring to the table. And, uh, I, I think we've come a long way in that regard. So I'm glad to see all of those women in those in those leadership positions, and I think they'll do an excellent job. I left off that we have a female mayor of city. That's of right. Too, that's so. right. That's <laughs> right. And and other female mayors around the region, um, uh, around this region. So I think that's a, a good thing. Um, I, I want to just you you have a little perspective on uh, on uh, technology and 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 students and and planning school, doesn't it seem like not only is the technology getting more advanced, the students seem to be um, so much brighter, so much connected. I mean, they seem to, when they graduate, to be a few years ahead, where, ahead of where I was when I graduated. I do don't you think see that's that. true? I don't see oh, that. Oh, you don't see that? I do not see that. As a matter of fact, there are some things that I see that uh, they have deficiencies in. And um, one of those is the public involvement. Um, realm and activities. Um, the other thing that I don't see them teaching in planning school that is very vital are some of the zoning uh, type activities. I don't see our students coming out with a grasp of zoning and that's really what implements land use. And so if you don't have a, a good grasp of, of zoning concepts and what that means and how different they can be between community and community, then uh, you, you might get hurt <laughs> Right. Out there, when you're trying to implement uh, something that, that you've uh, that you've created, I think those are both excellent points. I think <laughs> I think uh, zoning is not taught enough because we're we're trying to push them to reach out to the newest tools and not so much one of what's really the basis. You know, the other one is uh, that I hear a lot of, about is they don't come out of school knowing enough about just general government operations. Absolutely, and 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 that's why in my in a, earlier on when we started talking. I, I talked about the program and how different it is now. We had to know, we had to learn how government and planning works. It wasn't just the planning processes themselves. We had to have a, 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 a strong understanding of how uh, planning um, works within governments. And that's very, very different between governments. And so if you don't have a good grasp of that um, and you're out there with your Kind of focused on design and and right. and and data processing and and mapping, 
then you'll miss the whole point of what planning is and how it and how it's implemented and how it functions. And so I, I think we need to get back to some of that when, uh, in our planning schools, that we need to get back to the basics. <laughs> so. I, agree with, I, I agree with all those points. <clears throat> um, you know, can you talk about it, some of the, the model communities you that you think are, are sort of doing it right in Metro Atlanta? I, I, I can't. Or at I, least maybe not doing it right, but, but seem to... Uh, to be a, a good model for other communities? What I mentioned a few minutes ago about having um, taken a volunteer group, uh, our business group, out to see a community, and that community was Smyrna. I am very, very impressed with how uh, that community intentionally decided to um, repurpose and revitalize their community, and it didn't take a whole lot of time. It didn't. It wasn't a 30-year plan that they implemented. Um, they were intentional about planning their um, kind of uh, uh, downtown mixed use, where the the public was going to in, invest in that infrastructure as well. So they intentionally put their city hall and government center there around all of these um, uh, businesses and made it walkable and scalable for so that people could get around. But it only took them a few years. I would say 10 years at the most. Of course, they're still burgeoning. But I, I wanted to show that community just how um, that it can be done. And, and uh, they did an excellent job. The other community that has really come into its own is the city of Decatur. Uh, I'm very impressed with how um, it has revitalized. And once again, it's because the leadership has been intentional about uh, moving forward and, and, and turning of the city around and taking advantage of instead of letting the uh, uh, some of the things that they looked at 25 years ago as being negative uh, turning around and using it to their advantage. Uh, now it has taken them 20, 25 years, but that's okay. It it uh, at at some point somebody uh, was intentional about planning for that city, and so now it's happening quickly, and people are able to really touch and feel uh, Decatur. And uh, how it's how it's how it's come into its own. I think those are two good examples in the in the region. So uh, so vision, uh -huh, vision, I guess stability of staff, elected officials, absolutely, and, and, and sort of continuous improvement. Absolutely. You mentioned Decatur and the city of Smyrna being two good municipal examples of planning. Uh, do you want to just say a few other things about those? Sure. I, I think those are examples of of where um, the as you mentioned the vision has been uh, realized and uh, they have the staff and they have the wherewithal and the intention of making it happen. And if we want to show, if we want to showcase any communities, I think those are two communities, different sizes, but uh, two examples of, of good planning and sound planning and how you can uh, turn a community around. And we, we talked a, earlier a little bit about this going from comprehensive plans in Georgia to now mm -hmm. more community planning. And those are both uh, areas, I like to say, uh, a size that you can get your mind around it. When you think of Gwinnett yes, County yes. or Cherokee County, right, right, much larger land areas, do you think that's something that those the counties could learn from and say, look, we need to break it into smaller parts? There are, because even, and, and as Gwinnett, um, using Gwinnett as an example, or any any county as example, you still have people who um, never get out of their immediate surroundings. So there are people in Gwinnett County who've never been all over the county. <laughs> They've never seen the entirety of, of Gwinnett County. I lived in a community um, in a suburb out recently, and I would talk about how often I have to go into town during the week, and 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 with my neighbors, and they'd say. You went to town twice today, and I said yes. I had to. I had to go into town twice today. Into into the city of Atlanta twice today, and I said yes. Into the city of Atlanta, and they said, you know what? It's been three months since we've been into the city of Atlanta, and it, and it wasn't until I had that conversation, and that was a while ago, that I realized that really realized that people don't get out of their communities, and so uh, yes, I think the Gwinnetts and the Cherokees and any large county can certainly learn from now we have the county comprehensive plan let's take the let's break it into smaller piece, pieces and go into um, the smaller communities where people can really touch it and feel it you know the same could be said of, of a lot of residents outside of the Atlanta region mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. maybe come to the Atlanta region for a, for a Braves game 
hang out on the interstate and go home, and that's their opinion of Atlanta. And that's their opinion of Atlanta. Uh, that's right. Or, or even in the region. I'm, right, uh, right. That folks really don't know that there are neighborhoods and places that are very livable. That's right, and, and, and that it can be done in your community, too, if you are intentional about it. It's, I, I talk to people all the time who are, and they'll go to a Decatur or to a Smyrna, and then we get back and talk about, well, hey, that could work in our community, right? Then they can't see it. They can't see it working in, in their communities. And so it's that mindset of, of, uh, of, of having to, well, it's the intention of having to put, um, put it before them all the time right. and, and, and see how it can work. Make steps and yeah, operation. Yeah, make steps and operation and, and just kind of keep it before them and say, see, they can do it here, we can do it there. Do you find, uh, and this um, may not be the best topic, but this, this is sort of interesting to me how we define areas as suburban or urban mm -hmm. or city <laughs> or, um, or rural. Yeah. Um, I look at Gwinnett now and think it's, I don't know, 700,000 or more people and think, you're urban. Right. But if you asked people in Gwinnett, they'd say, oh, we live in the suburbs. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, <laughs> it's sort of interesting well, how we try to label it is. Places. It, it is, and we had to do that for a reason in planning, just so we could um, kind of uh, understand places and people and, and the demographic part of it. But yeah, every, every place is becoming urban in the Atlanta region, and that's why we've got to deal with these large infrastructure issues like transit. We can't, um, we can't, we, we, we can't cut off our boundaries anymore. Um, uh, because what's affecting you on this side of the street is going to affect me on that side of the street. So we can't um, put up our guards and, anymore like we did. And we did that in the 70s and 80s. We put up our guards in, at the counties around and um, it tried to shape what we were going to be like and, and how we were going to be. And, and we were not, we were going to disassociate ourselves with certain, <laughs> certain other governments and, and activities, but we can't do that anymore. It's followed us. And we're, so we've got to, we got to really. Uh, we're still doing that to some degree with <clears throat> gated communities. We are. Uh, we are. Uh, creating new cities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a little bit of the drive behind the new cities. Is yeah. To, to yeah. create some exclusivity of our area. Right. Yeah, uh, it, it is. Uh, it is, and it's, it's just, and I have nothing against wanting to be a little more in control of, if, if that's their reason for uh, creating it, in control of their destiny. Yeah. Um, but we have to be careful how we create that and how we work in that, that uh, structure because there could be unintended consequences related to that. They could isolate themselves so much that uh, some of the larger infrastructure needs that are, are going to be required for them in the future will not be there. And so when we put ourselves behind a gate and say, hey, you all keep out, um, at some point we're going to have to come out from outside of that, from inside of that gate and, and ask you for something, ask us for something that, that is going to be common to everyone in the region. So uh, isolating ourselves is, is um, we have to be very careful about that. Well, and, and, and I, I really believe public safety is something that every mm -hmm. community wants. Right. I don't care right. if you're an in-town community, a suburban community. Absolutely. And there's different ways of defining safety. Yeah. Uh, I never felt that my children were particularly safe on a busy neighbor road in a subdivision where I lived as because right. they were so close to speeding cars. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. It's, yeah. But and safety in general seems to be a core uh, neighborhood uh desire. It is, and, and we have to plan for safety, and we don't always do that in planning. We, that's, an, that's usually a lot of times an afterthought, and we, uh, we, have, to be in, we have to be very, and, and so that, that's where it comes back to that whole comprehensive uh, planning um, way of, of doing things. You've got to look at everything when you're, when you're conducting a plan that you just can't look at your subdivision and the streets and uh, what's in your subdivision. You've got to look at um, everything comprehensively because, and, and public safety, as you mentioned, have um, a lot of different uh, uh, scenarios. So there's the public safety in terms of police. I was working on a project um, not too long ago and the, it was a streetscape project and it was a busy state uh, highway and the community wanted, and it was a very strong commercial corridor and the community wanted these large trees and 
nice landscape and nice lush. And one of the things that the community had done was to invite the public safety community in to be a part of the process. And I remember um, one of the police, police officers saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, the, those trees are going to be nice, but in, in 10 years, they're going to be 20 feet. And we're not going to have a line of sight into some of your uh, commercial establishments if we're driving down the street. And don't you want us to have that? Don't you want us to be able to look over and see what's happening in, um, in your area or in these, in these businesses? And, the, you know, all of us stepped back and said, you know what, you're right. So they said, why don't you consider some crepe myrtles or something, <laughs> something that's attractive but, uh, but, uh, but gives us an opportunity to um, uh, see into your communities. The other uh, thing that we've got to, to do is, as it pertains to public safety, you talked about your not necessarily uh, ha feeling safe um, or your kids being safe, feeling that your kids are not necessarily safe. We've, we've really got to get back to the... Um, sidewalk and sidewalk and bi bike bike and pedestrian uh, development and including that once again not as an afterthought but as we're planning our communities i think there's a lot um, to be said for uh, though Im implementing those facilities in growing communities and going back and uh, versus going back and having to retrofit communities with um with with those facilities they're they're needed. People want to walk more. People want to bike more, but they just don't. They take their lives into their own hands by doing so on some of these um, on, on, in some of these communities. So, the bike and pedestrian infrastructure development, I think, is key to um, the Atlanta region. <clears throat> I think that's a good segue to thinking about what are the things we still need in the region and, and the future. Um, aging, you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm, aging, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. baby boomers. Um, the desire to be more active, right. um, air quality, um, uh, you know, we could talk about a lot. Can you kind of say what you think are some of the things I, we still need to do for the future? Well, we need to go back to doing things the old way and creating communities the way they were, communi uh, the way they crea were created may not have been unintentional, it may, that may have been unintentional um, 50 years ago. But think about it. We lived in communities where there was a corner store that we could walk to. Um, the schools were in our community. The, we had goods and services that we could get to without having to get into our car. And I, I use my hometown as an example. So the community that I grew up in, I could walk to school. I walked to school. I walked to the corner store. I walked to church. I walked to town. Now, my mother doesn't live in the same community that we lived in when we grew up. She lives in a, a, a newer subdivision and every time we want something we have to get in the car to drive to it. There is nothing around it that we can walk to and so we have to get back to that the, the intentionally getting back to the way we didn't know that we were creating mixed <laughs> mixed use communities. See that mixed use term is something that's new, but if you think about it, we lived in mixed use communities uh, 40 or 50 years ago because we had everything that um, we needed for the most part right there within walking distance or biking distance. The parks, everything was right there in, in uh, walking distance. So we just need to to get back to the old way of doing My things. mother used to ride the streetcar down Ponce to go to work in downtown Atlanta and go to Georgia State and right. ride the streetcar back and then walk a couple. She didn't think anything about walking. Absolutely. I mean, she'd walk Absolutely. long distances. Right, right, right. And 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 it and it uh, everything that she needed <clears throat> was within walking distance or uh, within distance of the of the streetcar getting her to it. But now, if you go out there and talk to the average Atlantan or, or regional person, you know their their lives are very different. They have to get in their cars and 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 drive everywhere, not just to you know the corner store, but everywhere. Have you experienced um you know when you just make a conscious decision to use transit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to walk more, mm -hmm. um, it really requires lifestyle changes. And we're not teaching that, really, are we? We're not, and 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 people don't get it. Um, I have a personal experience with that. I, I um, my husband and I recently married, <laughs> just a few years ago, and in looking for uh, a place to live, I told him that I wanted to be in a neighborhood where I, I could be within walking distance of, um, of public transit. 
I, I don't want to be isolated in a community where I have to um, get in the car to get everywhere. So I, I and, and, and likewise, we located our, our, our office the same way so that we're on public uh, transit system. But it was intentional. And as it turns out, it, it certainly we've needed it and we've used it. I, I, some of my employees have had ch challenges with their cars and they said, you know what, we're glad you're on the system <laughs> because we have an alternative. And now some of them are even using the system as the first option, not the second option. But you, you, have, to, you have to change the lifestyle. It's just that negative perception out there about uh, public transit and who's getting on it and, and what it's about. And if, you know, it's putting those people on that bus and showing them, hey, you can get to where you're going very easily without, without a car. Well, I'm, I'm a trained planner, and I find myself <laughs> trading off how much time it is to wait on the train or how much it costs for gas right. or do I want to buy a new car and where do I want to live? And, and everyone makes those trade-offs. Right, right. And, 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 and you have to make those trade-offs, particularly when you have, um, when you have families. But at, at some point, you can be intentional about it. So you can kind of uh, schedule your day, your week, um, so that uh, maybe two days a week, you don't have any meetings where you've got to <laughs> get in your car and be at a meeting in a half hour and, and so that you can take the train or you can take the bus. And then other days, you know that you've got to have your car to get to, um, to where you're going. And, and certainly if you have... Um, oh. I thought for a minute it might be construction, but you know what? It's sounding like almost like a, I was just saying that a, 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 when you make a conscious decision to be more transit dependent or more live in an urban area, the, there really is a, a mindset that you have to change almost the way most Americans have been raised. There is, and, and, but you have, to, you have to really focus on it. And it's not as hard as it sounds. It's just that we've got to um, be very mindful of those decisions, but it's not hard. It's it's very um, it, it it's very easy, and so it, and 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 people do it every day, and and people of all walks of life do it every day. But you you've got to make sure, it, or you've got to see that it's not as difficult as it sounds. Uh, the Transit Planning Board did a survey in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. of of statistically a, a significant survey, 90% of Atlantans drive alone, but almost 60% said they would support more, a, a sales tax for more transit. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like people are ready to embrace an alternative. That's a very different <laughs> but, mindset. But <laughs> I, I, if they had taken that survey, conducted that survey 25 years ago, yeah. the, the results would be very different. I think people are, are ready to look at alternatives and look at opportunities for options and so we're not forcing it's not forcing anyone out of a car it's giving people options and there are people who would like to have options but they just don't have any options yeah. uh, people who live in the suburbs or or people who live in the city who'd like to have options but there aren't any and and so we need to uh, it's about providing options we, we have built a lot of the same types of neighborhoods provided mm -hmm. the same transportation options um, and what percentage of the population do you think, I mean, is it a, a third, a half, that would consider living in a more livable, walkable place with transit alternatives? Any sense of that? I, I, think, um, I think at least half. I, I think now when people if, if realize that... If the, it was a one-to-one -one cost, I mean, if they, if they really had a true choice. Yeah, I think, I think half. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or or more. Yeah. You know, maybe even as high as you know, seventy five percent. Particularly now when you have a lot of seniors and yeah. Particularly and, when you have people yeah. who are yeah yeah and you and you and you need to provide that for them, and so I, I, back to that story I told you about a developer that's trying to put in a senior uh, development where it's in isolation. We are strongly opposing that, and we're opposing it not before not because of the development, but because of where it is. You're, you're isolating people, and and um, they are they are not drivers, and they're going to be stuck without the uh, assistance of, of a family member or someone who's um, out there helping them. And you can't do that. You, we we shouldn't do that. We have to be more mindful 
of those kinds of decisions. I heard a story recently that everyone supports their mo mother and father and senior citizens until you get into the details <laughs> <laughs> of where to put density. Of where to put density, yeah. Well, and, and, and um, I, that's, that's interesting because then the, it gets back to those um, personal decisions rather than, you know, decisions that are uh, affecting our communities. And, and so that's where we have to really um, draw the line that we can't make it just about us. It's about everybody. You know, it's about affecting everybody. You mentioned earlier uh, um, maybe what was holding back some decisions in communities and things. I, I, I'm not sure if you said it was a little bit of fear or mm -hmm. of the it unknown, mm -hmm. fear of change. Mm -hmm. Fear of change, yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's still present, isn't it? I mean, It's very much <laughs> present. And, and, uh, I, it's, and not only is it present, it's very difficult to overcome. It's, it's difficult to, con to convince people to change their mindsets about what they think public transit is or what they think um, uh, a dense development is going to do to, in their backyard or, or to their community or what an apartment complex is going to do to their community. It's very, diff it's very uh, hard to convince people otherwise, and, and um, it, it's, it's not easy to do. The, mind, the, the mindset is still here, but if, if, if we're not, but doing nothing, <laughs> it's, it shouldn't be an option or is, is not an option, so we have to show people how things can work. Well, doing nothing in a, in a market like Atlanta's where there's so much economic demand mm -hmm, and potential mm -hmm, for growth, mm -hmm. not taking action is actually going to have some result. It's going to have um, a <laughs> negative result. Yeah. yeah, it's going to have a negative result. And, and very and likely just turning over control to the whims of the economic yeah. know, process. Yeah, and that's scary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's very scary. But I, I, but, but, but we, we live in a great place. We live in a, a, a great region, and I'm very glad to have been a part of uh, the planning process and still a part of the planning process for the region. I think it has tremendous. Um, opportunity and potential as it always has had and uh, we again uh, get a chance to help shape that and help shape the minds of those people who are going to be making decisions and help shape the minds of those people who are whose uh, communities we're planning for. I'm gonna ask you, I got just one last question mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. is um, we do have a, I mean I gl I'm glad you touch on the positive aspects of mm -hmm. our region, mm -hmm. our city. We have a very rich history we do. Uh, we have a, a lot of very notable um, um, citizens who have lived here. We have great infrastructure in many ways. Mm -hmm. A lot of jobs. All right. Um, do you feel like we're you, that we're sort of really recognizing that enough and and, and taking advantage of it, or what? I, uh, I, should we celebrate it more? We should celebrate it more, and 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 we. The reason why we should celebrate it more is because people don't understand, don't realize what we have. They don't realize that, um, unlike a Detroit, for instance, that's um, or Flint, Michigan, that's totally um, dependent on the car industry. That we are kind of uh, we have multiple industries. So when one industry goes down a little bit, we still have another industry that's um, that still keeps us going. And so we're not one industry or one service area uh, dependent. And, and people don't think about it in, in those terms. But, you know, people are looking at Atlanta as the place to be because of, we, we do have multiple industries. We do have um, uh, multiple opportunities. And yes, we need to celebrate that more so that people, so that we understand that. Also, we need to plan around that. We need to look at how we plan around what we have and instead of trying to create new but planning around what we have. It's, a, it's amazing when you start listing all the organizations, mm -hmm. the, the universities, the Center for Disease yeah. Control, yeah. how many strengths we have. In how the many strengths is, we have. Very, very, very strong. And, and there aren't a lot of cities um, around the country that can boast that. Yeah. So we need to boast it and, <laughs> <laughs> and yell it from the mountaintop. <laughs>